It's a pleasure to be here. Just so you know a little bit about me. I took my first beekeeping course in 1966 when I was a sophomore at Michigan State University. Went on to do my master's and my doctorate in pollination and apiculture and, and beekeeping. Then I was the beekeeping specialist for 12 and a half years at Penn State University. Then I was offered a position at Mississippi State University as department head and professor, and but I continued to the bee work as well, uh, even though it wasn't part of my job description, and, and been retired since 2010, and continued to write for bee culture, which I think maybe I first started in like 1984, writing for bee culture, and, um, and do some lecturing, I'm uh, pretty selective, so feel. Thanks for coming. Yeah. <laughs> Florida. Chicago. Florida. Florida is a drawing card, absolutely, in the winter. Absolutely. All right. So much for about me. Let's let's, let's spend some time training you. I saw that there were several of you that raised your hands that you were beginner beekeepers. Uh, we're going to start out very general and we'll kind of get more and more in depth as we go this evening. Examining combs, what do they tell you? A lot of people are reluctant to go into the brew chamber, okay? Some of it may be fear of getting stung. Some of it may just don't want to spend the time lifting and handling all of that equipment. But what I'm going to try to convince you tonight is it's very, very important that you go into the brood chamber on a regular basis because that is where most problems originate. And if you're going to be an effective manager of your bees, you've got to have an understanding of what's going on within the hive and what is normal and what is not right, okay? Now, they, the bees will give you some subtle cues, but it takes experience to learn what those cues might be. And so that's what I'm going to be helping you with tonight. As you go into the brood nest, uh, what should you be, be looking for? Many is extremely important, as I said, because that is where most of your problems will originate. Combs. This is a comb. It's actually upside down. The top bar is here. The bottom bar is up there. This is the basic structural <coughs> unit of the hive. This is where all the action takes place, and this is where the subtle cues are going to be present for you to determine what is going on and what do you need to do if something is not right. This is true even with a feral colony, a wild colony, even in a wall of a building or in, in a bee tree as we see here. You can see the combs are shaped differently. The rectangular combs that we use in beekeeping, uh, except for those of you that are using top bar equipment, uh, that the shape of that and the size of it is for man's convenience. Typically, honeybees produce U-shaped combs, as you see here in this particular bee tree. But these combs have the same function as they have in your own hive, okay? And that is basically survival of the colony and reproduction of the colony. So the comb has many functions, and we're just going to look at a few of them tonight. First of all, that's where the reproduction of the colony occurs. Secondly, there is the storage of nectar and pollen, which is the primary diet of a honeybee colony. With both pollen and nectar, they have a complete balanced diet in addition to, to water. 
but it's also the foundation for establishing the winter cluster. Now most of you don't have to deal with winter clusters. <laughs> yeah. But it's it's the it's the foundation on which they are able to survive the winter, even in southern Florida, when the temperature drops below 57 degrees. Okay? It does? <laughs> I assume it does occasionally. Not this year. Not this year. Not even in Tennessee this year. Well, I had a couple times, but it's been a extremely mild. But it is the it is the surface on which they form the the winter uh, cluster, and it's also an orientation point for the communicative dances that the bees do. So think of the comb as being a dance floor. Okay, and we'll we'll look at what this information is conveyed here in just a few minutes. The first most important <coughs> part of reproduction in the colony is shown here. Here we have an egg. Here we have a tiny C-shaped larva. Here it's a larger C-shaped larva. Then it stretches out lengthways, as you see here, and we call it a pre-pupa. Then we go into the pupal stage. We begin to see the formation of the three body regions, the abdomen, the thorax, the head, and you can see the beginning of the compound eye. And then ultimately, this transformation from this legless little white grub ends up in an adult bee chewing its way out of the comb uh, and becoming part of the population. We said it's also where they store both honey and pollen. All right, here we see honey being stored. Again, for the beginners in the group, honey, when it's fully ripened by the bees, the bees go through a ripening process. Basically, there's a change in the sugars associated with honey. Honey is usually or predominantly made from 12 carbon sugars. All right? I'm not going to get them over your heads now, so just bear with me. Sucrose. White table sugar, okay? Sucrose. Each molecule is a 12 carbon sugar. When they go out and when the workers go out and collect nectar, they collect nectar that is predominantly sucrose. But then they add an enzyme. And that enzyme breaks each 12 carbon molecule into two six carbon molecules. And so honey, when it's fully ripened, is predominantly fructose and glucose, which are six carbon sugars. Only, a, only about 1.3% of honey <coughs> is made up of sucrose, the 12 carbon sugar. So there is a biochemical change that occurs during the ripening process. The other aspect that ha in this ripening process that's done by the bees is that when they cook, it may be 60 to 80 percent water. Honey is basically around 17 percent water. <coughs> so they've got to get rid of all that excess moisture. And so there's a, there's a transformation in the sugar composition from nectar to honey. There's also a change in the water composition. When the honey is fully ripened, then they place a wax covering on it, as we see here. So the, this honey is high moisture honey. If you were to extract a large number of combs that, containing honey that looks like this, you likely would end up with a problem of fermentation, uncontrolled <laughs> fermentation. If you control fermentation, you make me. Okay? <laughs> uncontrolled fermentation, the honey spoils. And so you want to limit the number of only partially capped frames that you uh, extract when you're going through the extraction process. You want that honey to have a moisture of around 17% or less. They also 
use the comb for the packing of pollen. They do not tap pollen cells, okay? They remain on tap, as you see here. And here we see where a worker has returned to the hive. She is carrying two pollen pellets on her hind legs, or in what we call her pollen baskets. She backs into a cell, and with the spines on her legs, she kicks off those pellets. All right, so here we see it. These pellets have been kicked off. House bees come along. They add chemicals that start the pre-digestive process of the pollen, keep it from spoiling, and they ram it with their heads. They pack it. Pack it in the cells. There's also bacteria that's regurgitated from the honey stomach that's also added uh, to help in this digestive process. So, cells containing pollen will be uncapped. Cells containing honey will be capped. <coughs> we said comb serves as a foundation for the formation of a winter cluster. This is the remnants of a dead winter cluster in the spring. Well, as you look at the frames, you will see there's no sign of food. So it doesn't take rocket science to figure out this colony starved to death. Okay? This is why we would recommend, if I was giving a lecture on spring management, I would recommend that there always be honey above and to the sides of the brood area or the cluster area if you're further north. Okay? So, because when they get to the top, they're going to be reluctant to go down and to move honey up. And so it's important that you always have honey above the brood area if they're going to survive. And so this is the remnants of a dead winter cluster. And there's a close-up of another one. Uh, they didn't make it. It was either they ran out of food when it, and it was too cold for them to break their winter cluster and to go uh, get uh, additional food. Then we said the comb is a dance floor. There are several different dances performed for, by bees, but there are two predominant ones, okay? The one on your left is called the round dance, all right? And you'll see this bee goes around, does a figure eight, comes back around, goes back around. Periodically, this bee stops especially if other bees are paying attention to it, touching it with their antenna. The bee stops. And the bee distributes droplets of nectar to those bees that are touching her and, and giving them a taste of this food source that they're, they're trying to communicate. Now, basically what the round dance says is this is what this food source tastes like. When they touch her with their antennas, they're finding out what this floral source smells like. And basically all it's saying is go out and with the, within the vicinity of the hive, within about 100 meters of the hive, you're, with, for your sake, we'll just say 100 yards uh, from the hive, okay? and search for this food source. And that's the information that's conveyed by the round dance. This is what it tastes like. This is what it smells like. Go look for it. The dance that you see here on... Oops, wrong button. The dance that you see here on your right is called the waggle dance or the wagtail dance. And the bee is dancing up the comb, turns, comes back around, dances up the comb, comes back around. If she is going, this waggle portion, 
If she is going up the comb, it says fly out of the hive and fly towards the sun. Directly towards the sun. If, she, if this bee is doing the waggle portion, and by waggle I mean she's, she's vibrating her abdomen. All right? She's vibrating her abdomen. And if she's coming down and then turning and down and turning, that says go out and fly directly away from the sun. But if she's doing it at an angle, let's say a 45 degree angle, she's saying go out 45 degrees from the, the sun, the position of the sun, and fly in that direction. All right, so with the waggle dance, the bee is indicating in what direction to fly. But secondly, the number of vibrations of her abdomen per second is telling the bees how much energy they have to expend to get to this food source. And so the further the distance, the, the faster the waggles of the dance. Okay? And so they're indicating distance and they're indicating direction. They do a similar dance for new home sites. Okay? If a colony is preparing to swarm, they will use the waggle dance and they are having scouts go out and examine this new potential home site or potential home sites. And the scouts will go out, check it out, come back. If they like it, on the surface of, this is after they've swarmed, on the surface of the cluster, they will do dances. All right? And so they may, there may be bees dancing for three or four different locations. But over time, they will reach a consensus. And then they will fly off as a group to their new home site. And that's another whole lecture in itself. <laughs> how they find it, how pheromones are involved in it, and I don't have time to get into it uh, tonight. For the beginners of the group, when you pull a comb out of the hive, you need to be able to recognize what is present. First of all, capped honey there, capped honey there. Now it's not real white in color as it would be if it was brand new honey. That just tells us that th this honey has been there for a while, okay? And the, the capping has absorbed some of the, the moisture of the honey. Um, and so it has kind of a, a wet appearance, a soaked appearance. That just tells us it's, it's perfectly fine. <clears throat> it just tells us that it's, it's older than freshly produced honey. Here we have cat worker brood. Again, for the beginners in the group. Honeybees have a four-stage life cycle. Egg, larva, pupa, and adult. Okay? Now, the cat stage that we're seeing here, that we're observing here, is the pupal stage. And as I've already indicated, this is where this tiny grub is transformed into an adult bee. And so, here we have capped worker brood. But here we have, we have bullet-shaped cappings that are higher over the surface. Alright? This is drone brood. This is capped drone brood. So you've got to learn to differentiate between those two. And then up here, we see some cells that contain pollen, and I've already shown you a close-up of those. So you need to be able to recognize these parts when you remove a comb um, from your hive. You don't have to be in beekeeping very long to come to realize that you never have enough drawn comb. Now again, for the beginners, what I mean by drawn comb is you put in a frame 
containing foundation, which is a blueprint for them to produce their six-sided cells. Okay? When they produce wax and they build out those cells on each side of the comb, we say they are drawing it out. So they're producing comb, they're building comb. Having lots of combs already fully drawn is a limiting factor in most beekeeping operations. Now, if you go out and collect a primary swarm, always put them on foundation. Because in a normal, in a normal population of workers, something on the order of maybe 10% of the workers have active wax glands. But in a primary swarm, part of the preparations in preparing for swarm, I'll get you in just a minute, part of the preparations in preparing for swarming is to engorge on honey and to activate wax glands. And so in a primary swarm, something on the order of 80% of the bees are ready to produce wax. And of course, drawing foundation is difficult unless there's a good flow underway. But if you start out with a population of bees making up a swarm, there's already going to be lots of active wax glands present to accomplish that. Question, comment? I'm going to respectfully disagree with your foundation comment for okay. sure on primers. Um, we steered away from that primarily because, for me at least, um, foundation, bad cell sizes has led to varroa problems. I, I, have, I have used absolutely none in my yards. Don't allow it, don't have it, and have no varroa. So what what are you using? Top bar hives? Not on this. I use I'll either use a star strip maybe, or I'll just leave it free and I'll just cut the comb back in if they start to cross it. You know. Okay, that's it's an entirely different approach, and as you've indicated, yeah. the benefit is it helps in suppressing uh, varroa mite populations. Uh, but I will still stand by my statement. It's a good practice if it fits into your operation and. The other thing is, if by chance you collect a swarm and they're ca carrying honey in their honey stomachs that has some American fall brood spores with it, they will consume all of that honey before they, in building wax, in building comb, before the queen will have a chance to lay, and so it will also help it as, a, as an American fall brood prevention technique. A way to get a large number of drawn combs and lower the small potential of picking up American fiber. All right, combs and hives are constructed on a concept that we call bee space, okay? And it's important that you use equipment from one supplier because when you start mixing suppliers, and many of us will do it, you're going to increase the chances of getting a lot of burr comb because the dimensions will be just slightly different from one supplier to another. Now let me explain what B space is. Any gap any gap that's less than a quarter of an inch, the bees will fill it in with the material they collect from buds and from the trunks of trees called propolis. Sometimes we call it bee glue. Okay? <laughs> propolis. Any gap that's less than a quarter of an inch, they will fill it in. They Waterproof the interior of the hive with propolis. Okay? Now, any gap, any gap that's greater than three eighths of an inch, they will fill it in with burr comb or brace comb. But if the gap is between one quarter and three eighths of an inch, they keep it open. 
So that's why frame spacing or comb spacing, that's why the distance between uh, bottom bars and top bars of the, the box below is so important because you, if you've got the B space between a quarter and three eighths of an inch, they will keep it open. If they not, you end up with a, with a mess. And this just, this just interferes with your management. Okay? The bees are going to survive in spite of it. <laughs> it's just a mess that you've got to deal with. Question here. I don't have that, but I do have a lot of the frames that are glued together basically by comb. So when I go to do my inspections, I don't want to break that okay. cohesiveness. Let, let, me, let me ask you a couple questions. Are you using 10 frame equipment? Yes. Are you using nine combs? Are you using 10? 10. 10? Then these, most top bars will automatically space them so that the, the, the gap will be right. Okay? Yeah, I don't understand. Um, so I'm not sure what the problem here, but you shouldn't be getting that much burr comb in between the combs. You will hear. You will hear. Remember, we're South Florida. We, we have, as general stock, hybrid aftonized bees. And they will build burr comb as bridges for the queen to walk between okay. the frames in order to do that. Okay, that's a good point. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, go over. Can they say something? They'll also build a, uh, a certain time the wax on the, on the uh, foundation. They don't like it, and they'll actually build these teardrop things off of that right. and get a space in between. And, and I usually, I just scrape it back and I make them rebuild it. And if you put it in between two frames that have already been drawn, it, it, it will help them it will help. It would not do that. It would certainly help, absolutely. Yes, it, it'll depend on what type of foundation you're using. I'll get you in just a second. It'll depend on the type of foundation you're using whether it's plastic or, or what, beeswax or, or what it is, it will also contribute to it. But keep after it. Okay. Yes, comment. So in this case, these features have nothing to do with this thing. Because as you see, that standard transfer <coughs> cut, which is specifically designed for space that is needed. In this case, it's indication what you made these additional new forms. So that's late. You're partially right, but well, also the gap between the top uh, bars and the uh, bottom bars. In this case, not, because it's standard Lancelot 5, which is very well built for these states. So in this case, only one part. Second part, when your D is built in between foundations, it's indication what you give foundation when colony is uh, swarming more. Only one case. If you give foundation on the right time, it will be no problem. Yeah. So here is management. It has have nothing to do with. It can be. No. It not always. always. I'm, I'm sorry to say. Oh, no. We're not going to get in an argument. We'll just move on. <laughs> okay. When combs are damaged, it can be you accidentally puncture it with your high tool. <coughs> It may be mouse damage, it may be wax moth damage, it may be you dropped a comb, whatever it might be, damaged combs, you're going to have a loss of brood area. Now, there's a damaged area. The bees may choose not to repair it. If they do repair it, they probably, the majority of the time, are going to replace it with drone size cells rather than worker size cells, which it was, which it was uh, originally. Uh, so we're going to get an increase of drone brood comb. And of course, if it happens in your honey supers and if you've got damaged areas, they're going to be uneven uh, and it's going to make extraction uh, more difficult. This would be an example of an area. This one, they have replaced it with worker size cells, so it apparently was not damaged extensively. But here, you can see where it was damaged, and they replaced it with drone size cells. Drone size cells have a bigger diameter, and they're deeper. 
Okay? And so you can see how they, they protrude out on the comb. Worker size cells are five to the linear inch. Drone size cells are four to the linear inch. All right, let's get back to where we were headed. Why examine brood patterns? Why go into the brood nest? And here are a number of reasons why, and we'll look at these as we go. First of all, it tells you the overall condition of the colony. Secondly, it will give you an indication of whether there is a queen present or they are queenless. Now, if you've kept bees for a long time, just by the tone, when you open up a colony and how much they roar, may tell you that they may be queenless. But there will be further evidence shown on, on the combs, and I'll get into that in a minute. The quality of the queen, you can determine by looking at the comb pattern. We'll show you some pictures in a few minutes. It tells you whether or not there's a, a honey flow underway, if there's fresh nectar and pollen coming in, and, if, and it also indicates to you uh, of the food stores, the size of the food stores. It's where you want to go to check for bee diseases and also for mite populations. Uh, and again, I'll, I'll do it into that more. It gives you an indication of colony strength. How many combs have brood? How many combs are covered with adult bees? Okay? Now, in some pollination contracts, it will specify there must be 10 frames of brood and bees covering 15 or 18 frames or something on that order. So it's used as a standard for colony strength for pollination purposes. Some contracts have that, others uh, do not. So that's important. It will also tell you if they are preparing to swarm, if they are developing this instinct to swarm, uh, and what then you need to decide what you need to do about it. And it's also an indicator of the population balance. And, and again, I will explain that when we get to it. All right, so first of all, question? Yes, thank you, Dr. For our, at the beginning, you mentioned that Examining the comb should be done often for our newbies. Could you say how often you would recommend? The question was how often should you be examining the brood nest? Normally, we would say you probably ought to go into it a couple times a month. Okay? The, the exception to that would be during your swarming season. When the bees are preparing to swarm, and then we would probably say every seven to ten days, just during the swarming season. Okay? That'll give you at least an idea how, how often. All right, so we said it's going to tell you about the overall quality of the colony. We said it's going to tell you whether they're queen right or queenless. I've already indicated. Listen to the sound of the bees. All right? Again, but this comes with experience. Okay? You're probably going to work bees for several years before you really get a tuned in, so to speak, and begin to realize, based on how noisy they are, uh, whether or not you, you expect for uh, a problem or not. All right. First of all, you need to look for eggs and young larvae. When I take a beginner group into the bee yard, one of the first things I teach them is how to see eggs. How to stand so that the sun comes over your shoulder, how to hold the comb so that the sun reflects off the bottom of the cell so that you can see the eggs. And as you get older, it's more and more difficult to see eggs. <laughs> 
even though you know what you're supposed to be looking for, it gets more and more difficult. Again, for the beginners of the group, if there are eggs present, that tells you there was a queen there within the last three days. Because from the time a queen lays an egg until it hatches, it's three days. So that tells you there was a queen there within the last three days. You want to look for signs of laying workers. Laying workers? What is this man talking about? <laughs> All right, let me explain it. And then we'll talk about I think later I'll, I'll show you a, a, a picture. Typically, in a colony, we have the queen. We have a population of workers. And under normal conditions, we would f say that most of the workers, if not all the workers, are sterile females. Their ovaries did not develop. The reason their ovaries didn't develop is because the queen is producing a pheromone that keeps their ovaries from developing. Okay? Now, if a colony goes queenless in about three weeks' time, you will see workers laying eggs because that chemical is no longer there inhibiting their ovaries from developing. But the problem is, worker bees cannot mate. So they can only lay unfertilized eggs. And unfertilized eggs become drones. And they lay a lot of these eggs in worker-sized cells and so we end up with little drones. We call them runts or runny drones. Okay? Research has shown that, yes, they can be competitive when they're on mating flights and in the drone congregation areas, but they're probably going to lose out because they can't fly as fast as a full-size drone. Okay? So they're probably going to lose out. But, if you removed semen from those runny drones, you would find that it has the ability to fertilize an egg. So the semen's okay, it's just because of their small size, they're probably gonna get out-competed, okay? Now, what do you look for? You look for multiple eggs per cell, okay? Normally, the queen, when she lays an egg, she's going to lay it directly in the bottom of the cell and stand it on end. It looks like a, a kernel of rice standing on end. And she lays one per cell. Now, once in a great while, conditions will have queens lay multiple eggs per cell. But it's a, it's a management issue. Okay? The other thing is, the workers can't center them. So they're laid on the sides of the cells, haphazardly all over the cells. So multiple eggs and haphazard placement of the eggs within the cells would be the cue if you've got a serious problem, your colony's queenless, and you've got uh, laying workers. Look for a virgin queen. They're hard to spot. Number one, they're smaller than regular queens because their ovaries haven't swelled up yet. They haven't mated yet. And they, the ovaries haven't, aren't fully developed yet. So they'll be smaller. The other thing about it, if you go, go into a hive and see virgin queens, is that they're going to be running all over the place. They're very nervous. They get hassled by the workers. <laughs> So they're like running away from the workers. So it, it's difficult to see a virgin queen because she's smaller, she's about not much larger than a worker, and she's very nervous and running around. Mm -hmm. All right, the other cue that tells you that you may have a queenless problem, look at the pollen. Is there fresh pollen in the cells, or is the pollen, does the pollen look old and have a glassy, wet appearance? And that would be an indication that chances are 
uh, they, they are, are queenless. So that tells you if you've got a queen right <coughs> or a queenless uh, colony. Why would the pollen would, would be old? Do you want to bring a new one because they're, they're missing a queen? Would you repeat your question, please? Why would the pollen be, will be old? Uh, they'll stop bringing new pollen if they're missing a queen? The question was, will they stop bringing in new pollen if they're missing a queen? And the answer is yes. Okay? There are actually... There are actually three characteristics that stimulate bees to collect pollen. One is the presence of brood. The second is a pheromone that's produced by the brood that we call brood pheromone. <laughs> yeah, I mean, this is really scientific now. <laughs> and the presence of a queen. Okay, Those are the three characteristics that stimulate workers to go out and collect pollen. If they've been queenless for three weeks, they will stop bringing in fresh pollen. Yes? So if you're standing outside the hive and you're just sitting there looking at the entrance and you have a good stream of workers bringing in pollen, it's a reasonable indication that you're probably clean now. That is correct. His comment was, if you're standing in front of your hive and there's a large stream of workers coming in with pollen pellets on their hind legs, that probably tells you that it's queen right and it's probably okay. That doesn't mean you should not go in and look for other problems. <laughs> but I will agree with, with your comment and observation. You're absolutely right. Yes? What do you do when you do have a virgin queen or what is uh, the consequence? All right. If you have a virgin queen or you have multiple virgin queens, you would just leave them alone let them go out on their mating flights and return and they would kill, try to kill each other off until there's only one remaining. And so you would hope, if you saw virgin queens, you would hope that say in two weeks time, there's then going to be eggs present and the beginning of reproduction. So you gotta keep an eye on them. Gotta keep an eye on them, absolutely. Yes. Yes. Would you explain to them how easy to detect the presence of virgin queens? How easy it is? How easy here to take. How easier? You're just going to open it up? No, they are new. They, they cannot find it. Most people cannot find a virgin queen. <laughs> <laughs> you know, in this case, better to put larva in your body. Go back one day later, and if you don't have queen cells, you have queen. If you don't, if you have queen cells, you need no uh, anything in your, in your body. All right, but that's very early in queenlessness. If they've been queenless for three weeks, and you would add a, a frame containing young larvae, uh, they might not do anything with it. They may not produce they emergency do. queen cells. Uh, anyway, in Florida, they will build. They will build in Florida. Uh, most areas they will. They may, but they probably will not. They'll and build and they'll tear it down. And they I they, they, they may start to build it and tear it down. Yeah. You're absolutely right. Um, <coughs> I had another thought there. Escape me. Uh, oh, a colony with queen or laying workers it will be very difficult to introduce a new queen. Okay, Very difficult to introduce a new queen. And the reason is, these laying workers begin to produce pheromones similar to a laying queen. And we call these laying workers pseudo-queens. Okay? And if there are pseudo-queens present, and the queen's pheromones present, they probably will not accept a new queen. And this is, may also interfere with them raising emergency queens. Comment on back here. Yeah, um, in situations where we have multiple virgin queens in a hive, we'll very easily, if the queens battle and they both survive, end up with secondary and tertiary swarms that end up going out with virgin queens. Absolutely. So that happens all the time down there. Yeah, it does everywhere. Okay. It does everywhere. Uh, let me continue. 
and we'll get to some more questions in a few minutes. All right. This is what the queen looks like, again, for the beginners of the group. You see the queen is surrounded by a retinue of workers. This is sometimes referred to as the queen's court. Now, every time you see a queen, you may not see this circle of workers. The reason is, when she's moving, this circle or this court kind of breaks up. But every time she stops on the comb, then it may reform itself. Now the purpose, the purpose of this retinue of workers, one, they are feeding her. Queens rarely feed themselves. They may, while they're being shipped, say in a package, they may feed themselves. But when they're laying eggs within the colony, food is provided constantly. Of course, the more eggs she's laying, the more food that is required. Secondly, they are grooming her. Thirdly, they're removing her waste. And probably most importantly is, they're licking pheromone from her body and passing it through the entire population of bees. Okay? And that's how, you know, maybe only 20, 30 workers in a day's time will come in contact with the queen. But they all know, one, if they have a queen, and two, how good she is. And it's because of the, the pheromone that's being distributed throughout the population. And again, that's another whole lecture in itself. I'll just leave it uh, at that. This is what the eggs look like when they're laid by a queen. Okay. I said we can determine the, the quality of a queen, the quality of a queen by looking at her brood patterns. If I just handed you a frame, and there's a queen, and I would say, is that a good queen? You can't tell by just looking at her. She might be big, she might be little, that doesn't tell you if she's good or not. The only way to determine the quality of the queen is to look at her brood patterns. And basically we're looking for either a solid brood pattern or we're looking for a spotty brood pattern. Alright? Good queen? Okay? I agree. It's a nice large pattern of brood very few openings, and so we would say that's a solid pattern, and, and we would conclude this colony is headed up by a good queen. This one's smaller, but would you still say that's a good queen? I agree. You know what the difference is? That first comb was probably taken in Pennsylvania uh, in July, and this one was taken in April. All right, so the size of the brood area uh, is going to expand as springtime occurs, but what you're still looking for, is it solid or not? And that tells you if it's a good queen or not. All right, we've talked about laying workers. This is what it looks like. All right, that's what it looks like. That's a thing of beauty. Okay. Combs serve as a reservoir for pathogens. Okay? This is where diseases originate within the colony. So we're going to examine the combs and begin looking for evidence of diseases. We're going to look at the cappings, we're going to look at color changes. And larvae and pupae. We're going to look for what we call scale, and I'll show you a picture of scale in a few minutes. And we're going to look for something we call mummies. It's associated with chalk brood disease, and we'll show you a picture of that in, in, in a minute. All right. He said, first of all, we're going to look at cappings. All right. 
Again, if I had a group of beginners in the bee yard, and we were looking at this comb, and I see a hole. When I see holes in tappings, I may get concerned. However, I'm not concerned with this one mm -hmm. for two reasons. One, the wax is light colored, okay? But secondly, the hole is right in the very center. They begin, when they build a capping on a cone, they begin at the outside and they work towards the center. Mm. So if it's right in the center, that tells me probably everything's all right. But just to be on the safe side, I might take my hive tool and just nick a little that away and look at the larva underneath, just to be sure. But my first reaction is, that's a healthy situation. That's okay. Ooh. Here's a second comb. Now, there are several clues here that something is not great. The first one is... The smell. <laughs> that was going to be my last one. Uh, you, you get that before you get anything else. Right. Okay, so we'll start with smell. Okay. It doesn't smell good. Okay? Secondly, I would call that a spotty brood pattern. Oh, yeah. yeah, that's spotty all right. <laughs> and it might be an indication of a poor queen. Yeah. Not with those but, the, holes. but there's other things here that tell me no, it's not queen problems. It's something else. All right. That's not, that hole is not in the center. That hole is not in the center. That one is close, but not exactly. But the other thing that, that really tells you something's not right here, something cappings. So we got a spotty brood pattern, a bad smell, sunken cappings, and holes in the cappings. This tells us not good, not good. Out. Ooh, this one's even worse. <laughs> Here we got dark cappings, sunken, holes, <laughs> and I can assure you, a really bad smell. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay? So these are clues that you'll be looking for when you go into the brood nest. Hopefully you'll never see this. All right, let me back up. Both this one and this one is American fall brood. It's a bacterial disease, okay? And it's bad news. Because the bacterium, penny bacillus larvae, produces spores. And once there are spores present, then that just uh, distributes it to all the bees that come in and rob the hive out. And as they feed, brood, and et cetera. So both of these are bad news. But the point here is, you're looking at cappings, you're looking at the spottiness of these cappings, whether they're sunken cappings and holes. That all tells you something's not right. Now, if you don't remember anything else tonight, I want you to remember one thing. White means healthy. White means healthy. Here we have C-shaped larvae. We've got a, a real young one here. We've got older ones here. But they're white. And so they are healthy. Here we have a pre-pupa after it's stretched out lengthways in the cell and they begin to produce the capping over it. But it's basically white. It's healthy. Here's a pupa. Other than the compound eye, it's white. In the early stages of the pupal stage, it's white. And then they will get purple eyes, and then they will continue to add pigment to their exo 
the exoskeleton, etc. But in this stage, it's white. That tells you it's healthy. But now you pull out this frame. All right. That one's healthy. The other ones aren't. <laughs> but the others aren't. One out of four, that's pretty bad. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty bad. You're absolutely right. But the point here is, if there are changes in coloration, especially at this stage of development, that's an indication something's wrong. Here's one's turned totally. Ah, here's, here's a pupa. It's not white. Okay. No, it's dead. It's dead. It's dead. But let me back up a minute. Let's explain what we've got here. This is European fall root. You're seeing the color changes occurring in uncapped cells. You are seeing some of them take on a twisted appearance, lying on the side of the cell, not in the bottom of the cell. So twisted larvae, uncapped cells, color changes. <coughs> this is an indication of European fall root. The other thing you'll often see with European fall root, you see these white streaks. Do you know what those are? The trachea. Breathing tubes. And with European fowl brood, many times we will see the breathing tubes within uh, the developing larvae. But the point here is, the most important point is, there's a color change, and that's not right. This one is a uniform color change. See, most of these weren't uniform except that one. They're not uniform. This is a uniform color change. This is American fall root. The pupa is a uniform color change. This is caused by American fall root. Now we got another clue here that if you ever see, you do, do not want to neglect. This is referred to as a pupal tongue. The proboscis of the developing pupa. Pupal tongue. If you see pupal tongues and a color change, you don't need to look any further. You don't need to call the bee inspector. You don't need to contact a mentor. It's American fiber. But, you can have a hive that is just ripe with American fowl brood, in other words, loaded with American fowl brood, and never see a pupil tongue. <coughs> what I'm telling you is, if you ever see a pupil tongue, you don't need to go any further. But realize you may see many times no pupil tongue. And the reason for that, there are different strains of Penibacillus larvae, the causative ag uh, agent of American fowl root. Some kill faster than others. Normally with American fowl root, death occurs over a four day period. The last two days of the larval prepupal stage and the first two days of the pupal stage. That's normally when death occurs. If death occurs before the latter third or fourth day of the pupal stage, there will be no pupal tongue. It's the slower forms or slower strains of the bacterium that's going to then give you the pupal tongue. Question. Is this photo a cross section of the side of the mm -hmm. cell? Yes. In which case, how would we ever see that? We're not going to cut our cells. You're, you're going to look in, and you're going to see a pupil tongue sticking right out. I see. But you're also going to look in, and you're going to be looking at the, the head end here right here. Yes. And if it's not white, 
that tells you you need to pull it out and examine it further. Okay? That clarify that? Okay. Somebody else, I think it was uh, uh, Caitlin, said to stick a toothpick in the cell and you have yeah. them like a strand. That's, a, that's another way. I'm just telling you based on symptoms that you can see with your eyes. But another thing is to take a toothpick or a dead stem, uh, a grass, <laughs> stick it in, and you pull it out if it strings at like a ropey condition, that's another good indication. But see, it's got to be right at the right stage of decomposition before you'll get that ropey stage. And so I'm giving you some of the early and it, and so it'll it'll still stink. And it will still, it'll still stink. stink. <laughs> yes. All right. Now why is it? All right. This is sac root disease. With sac root disease, the head end normally turns color uh, before the rest of the body. It doesn't show up real well on that particular slide, but this is sac root disease. What was that again? Sac root. S a c b r o o d. Sac root. Is that a fixable one? Yeah. Another breaking the root cycle. Yeah, you've got to break the root cycle. Uh, it does not, it doesn't, uh, no, I don't believe spores are involved here, no. I haven't, I haven't dealt with this in a while. Okay, I said we're going to look for mummies. No, I said we're going to look for scales. Scales, okay? These are the scales that I'm talking about. Okay, these are dried down, decomposed, Pupae. Every one of those scales is several hundred thousand spores. Oh my God. Yep. The bees cannot remove it. So they put honey in the cell. So the queen's not going to lay in it. But they put honey in the cell. The honey softens it up. But then all those spores go into the honey. And so as that honey is robbed out or taken out, etc. It will, the, the disease will be um, transferred. Um, so if you're going to look for scales. Yes, comment. Question. If you found this, would you just take the frames out and uh, just destroy the foundation? Or burn it. What's the burn, it or burn. burn is the best. Burn. burn is the best control method. Now, some would say the only control method. I don't know what the Florida law says. Burn. In this state, burn. Okay. We don't need to discuss it any further. But shouldn't you tell everybody that if, if you get something like that, like if I found that in mine, the first thing I do is put a trash bag over it to contain it. Right. And you don't then, want other bees robbing it out. Find a place to burn. But yeah. don't let it. Don't leave it open. No, definitely not. <laughs> good point. Good, good point. Um, and typically, you burn the yeah, whole. Yeah, you kill the bees. Bees burn everything. Burn everything. Bees and all. Bees and all. Yeah, bees and all. That's what the state says. Yeah. Yes. This is the only situation where you burn it. Yeah. Or no, this is the only situation where you burn. Yeah. Oh, well, it has a scale. No, when that's foul brood. That's foul brood. It is the condition under which it can be burn. any. Any stage. Any stage of foul brood burning. And that's American foul brood, not, not European foul brood. Not European, right. And this is the best way to detect it. Yeah. Yes. Well, this is just one of the ways. One of the ways. What yeah. about four? Color chain. I'm giving you all. Yeah. All, okay. stage all these situations. Yeah. see all these situations in any of your hives. And you've got foul brood, it needs to be burned. Right. You should contact the state. Yeah, they, they can test it for you. We right. also and said you need to be looking for mummies. Uh, these are... These are pupae and, and pre larvae that are pre, pre pupae that have dried down like and they're hard. If you took a comb and a lot of these in, it would they would rattle, but they would literally fall out. Alright? These are called chalk brood mummies, and this is a fungal disease. Uh, it will not kill a hive. Uh, it may hold it back somewhat in the spring. Um, Moist conditions, cool temperatures uh, stimulate this particular disease. So white isn't always good. <laughs> <laughs> there was a little brown on one end. <laughs> All right. We said this is how you would check for mites. And one of the there are a lot of techniques that you can use to sample your varroa mite populations, and I'm sure you've had many programs on it. 
But what I want to say is, if you want to check a brood comb for the presence of mites, go to the cap drone brood that you see there and pull the cappings off, pull out the drone pupae, and look, because they're more apt to be in drone brood than they are in worker brood. All right, so if you're going to check for mites, again, for the beginners in the group, they look like mahogany or um, little crabs running around on the surface. They're um, ticks. They look like ticks, yes, that's another way of describing them. This, happened, this is either a nymphal stage or a male. Males, so if you see one like this, that's a female. Females are always that color, and they're the, the mobile ones that go in and out of cells. Okay. Uh, here we see another type of larvae crawling around that has a serious problem. It's a small hive beetle. If you see webbing, this is wax moth. Okay, so webbing is the key clue that you need to be looking for there. All right. We said it also helps you determine the population balance uh, of the hive and the strength of the hive. Obviously, there's nine frames covered with bees in that one. In that one, we're looking at three. Okay, so it gives you a, a, a measure of strength of the colony. How many frames of bees, how many frames of brood. Looking at the combs will also tell you when honey supers need to be added. Some people put on a super, and when it's just jam full of honey, they say, well, maybe I ought to add another one. All right, do that up north, not down here. <laughs> <laughs> what I'm suggesting is, everybody see this, this little white streak of wax along the edges of the top bars? If you see that on three or four combs in the honey super, that tells me it's time to add another honey super. Okay? Especially if there is a flow underway and you've got cells of liquid nectar being ripened into honey, as we've already described to you, uh, then it's time to, to add the next super. Uh, you know, way back before small hive beetle, we were very generous in adding supers. Now with small hive beetles, uh, it's really cut us back. All right. This is going to be more difficult to understand and comprehend, but it's just a ballpark thing for I want you to think about, okay? We said looking at brood combs will tell you about the population balance in the hive. All right. How much brood should you have? Can there be too much? Yes. Can there be too little? Yes. Yeah. Absolutely. So what is normal? This is what we got to figure out. We, we're Figured out how it is healthy, now we got to figure out what is normal, okay? I want us to study this chart for just a minute, because what we're going to give you now is based on this chart. And we're, really, we're just going to concentrate on worker right now. We said the egg stage is, is three days, the larval stage is six days, the pupil stage is 12 days, and we expect a new worker to emerge in 21 days from the time the egg is laid. All right, now, everybody agree that this is twice as much as this? Yeah. All right, not too tough so far, is it? <laughs> everybody agree that this is twice what this is? All right, everybody agree that this is four times what that is. So far. Yeah. Okay. We gotta get that, we gotta get that in our minds. Okay? Get that in our minds. Alright. So that tells us based on the life cycle of the bee, given the number of eggs that we have, we should have twice as many larvae 
And we should have four times as many pupae as eggs. Anybody struggling with that? Okay, twice as many larvae and four times as many pupae as eggs. Now, I am not suggesting that you go out and start counting eggs <laughs> <laughs> and pupae. Leave that up to the scientists, okay? I have, I've done a lot of that as a graduate student. <laughs> <laughs> but I want you to get a gut feeling of where we're going with this, okay? So I'm not asking you to count, but I'm trying to help you to see if there has been a break in the brood rearing cycle. Based on the, based on the idea, we should have twice as many larvae as eggs and four times as many pupae as eggs. Alright, this is just one example, but this will this gives you an idea of what we're looking at, what this gut feeling should be. Once a queen is laid for three weeks uninterrupted, the healthy hive should have brood of all stages and all ages. Okay? We would expect to find 12 to 15 percent eggs based on the number of, of cells present. All right, so if we find 12 to 15% eggs, we would expect to find 30 to 35% uh, larvae. All right, about twice what we have, right? Everybody with me so far? And 50 to 60% of the brood cells should be capped pupae. All right, well, four times 15 is 60, right? Okay. Four times as many pupae as eggs? Still with me? Still with me. Okay. Any deviation from this indicates a break in the brood rearing cycle. So I want you to get a gut feeling. Are there twice as many larvae as there are eggs? Are there four times as many pupae as there are eggs? Is it in the ballpark or not? That's what you need to ask yourself when you're examining your brood nest. What can cause a disruption in the brood cycle? Anything that causes the queen to stop laying or that destroys the brood. It could be a pesticide kill, death of a queen, lack of a nectar flow or food supply, diseases, Parasitic mites, weather, all this could change. It's two times, four times concept or ideas. So you need to you need to say, is this colony normal? Is it developing as normally as it should be? Or has there been a problem? And if you think there's been a problem, then what has it? what is the cause of that particular uh, problem. It also tells you, when you examine a brood comb, whether or not the bees are preparing to swarm or they are preparing to raise a new queen. Queens are reared under three different impulses. Emergency, supersedure, and swarming. Now, is that supersedure or is that emergency? Is that supersedure or is that emergency? You go into a hive and you find a queen cell or you find several queen cells, you've got to decide what's going on. Okay? This could be either because it's a modified worker cell. There was a worker larva in a cell three days old or less that was selected by the bees and so they 
extended the size of the of the um, <coughs> cell and made it so it has a vertical orientation. This is a peanut shaped cell. It could be either emergency or supersedure. If it's an emergency, you probably want to leave it alone. If it's a supersedure, you may still want to leave it alone. But you need to know what's going on. Okay, so you've got to look for other evidence. What does supersedure mean? All right. Okay. Let me go back and explain this in detail. Uh, good question, because I'm sure there are some others that do not understand. All right, I'm going to I'm going to go back, and I'm going to talk about this in relation to pheromones. We already said the queen produces pheromones that keeps the worker ovaries from developing. Okay. That same pheromone, bouquet, also keeps the bees from raising queens. Okay? Inhibits queen production. All right, so we got a colony. We got a healthy, normal queen. And she's just uh, bopping along, doing her thing. And she's producing pheromone. The pheromone, as I've already described, is being distributed throughout the population of bees. The bees know, based on her pheromone, based on her chemicals, everything is a-okay. But, if you're examining your comb and she falls in the grass, <coughs> <laughs> and doesn't find her way back, and you don't even realize it. Okay? Now, two minutes ago, two minutes ago, before she fell in the grass, there was plenty of queen pheromone. Now, in a matter of minutes, there is no pheromone. She's long gone. That within 20 minutes time, the bees sense that there's no pheromone, they're queenless, and they proceed to raise what we call emergency queens. Okay? Now, let me make a couple more comments in regards to that before I go into super secret. Because it's an emergency, because they're queenless, they are going to select older larvae. And they can select larvae up to three days of age. So if it's an emergency queen cell, it's probably going to be a poor quality queen because it hasn't received six days of great care and food, etc. It's only going to receive three days. <coughs> Right, really two and a half, okay? So you're probably, with emergencies, you're gonna get four queens, okay? The question I always like to ask is, what is the shortest time that they can have a new queen? Not laying, not mated, just a new queen emerge. What is the shortest period of time from, they can have a new queen? From egg to, to emergent? From the time the queen is lost. 13 days. 10 days. 13. I hear 10 here. We have a winner. 10 is the 10 is the right answer. Because three days in the egg stage, and they select three day old larvae, and in 10 days they can have a new queen. 16 total. Okay? But what I'm saying to you is it's not the greatest queen. Mm. Or the greatest batch of queens. So this is why you need to know, it. is it an emergency or is it supersedure? I'll get you in just a minute, okay? Now, back to his original question. Supersedure. As the queen ages, she produces less and less pheromone. All right? She's getting old and she's not, she's not what she used to be. 
<laughs> okay? I told you her pheromone keeps the bees from raising new queens. But as she declines, she will get to the point where she produces less pheromone than what inhibits them from raising a queen. And so in a, with a low amount, or below this threshold amount of pheromone, that tells the bees, raise a new queen. And that's what a supersedure is. They're replacing a failing queen. She's still there, but they're replacing her. <coughs> because the old girl's not what she used to be. Okay? Now, I had a question back there first. Or a swarming situation, they will select younger larvae. Maybe a one-day-old larvae. And start feeding it. And start feeding it royal jelly. Royal jelly right to the get Right. Right. But if it was going to become a worker, and it's in day three, they're switching from royal jelly to bee bread. Bee bread, or yeah. well, that's as good an answer as any. Bee bread. In fact, at about they give them enough royal jelly to last about two, two and a half days. So I'm saying they probably have gone, I'll say, up to 24 hours without royal jelly. Mm -hmm. And that's why you're going to get a four queen. Okay. Well, there's two different types of, uh, of the milk or whatever, the royal jelly, and then there's like a lesser for the workers. It's not got the nutrients. Right. Right. It's still liquid, though. It's not, it's not bee bread. Well, they're both. They're both. They put bee bread down in there before they have to. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. They yeah. begin yeah. feeding them pollen, or we call it bee bread. Uh, so yes, there's a difference in diet, and, and biochemically, if we analyze royal jelly, we analyze worker jelly, we analyze drone jelly, you will find that they are slightly different. Okay, now you had a question or a comment. Just a quick, uh, in, in both situations, emergency and supersedure, will they create more than one queen cell? Yes, yes. Uh, in emergency situation, they may create up to 20. And in a supersedure situation, we're probably more in a ballpark of 10 to 12. Wow. So the position of the cell, the number of cells, would be some clue for you as to maybe what's going on. But now we got to get back to his. That's swarm cells, swarm the queens that are produced in preparation for swarming. Let's get back to our pheromones. The hive is crowded. Congestion. We often say congestion is the primary reason that the colony begins to prepare the swarm. This congestion interferes with the distribution of queen substance. Okay? And so as and it may also have to do with her declining as well, an older queen. Okay? Because we, we know that a, a colony headed up by a two-year-old queen <coughs> will swarm more than twice as often as a colony headed up by a one-year-old queen. So part of it has to do with her declining. Part of it has to do with inefficient distribution of the queen pheromone because of the, the crowding condition in, in the hive. And so they, they begin to raise queens and ultimately may end up swarming. Uh, you want me to go any further than that? Okay, so those are the three impulses in which to raise queens. Swarming queens, supersedure queens are considered to be of higher quality than emergency queens. That's why it's important for you to try to figure out what's going on. If they're preparing to swarm, obviously you want to stop it. All right, and that's another whole lecture in itself as, as well. Um, there's one other point I was going to make. Maybe I'll come back in a minute. Yes. Sorry, will the swarming queen cell, will there be as many of those as there would be emergency? Yes. Could there be 10 or 20 or more? Yeah, it'll probably be on the order of 10 to 15. But the basic difference between swarming and supersedure is if they're preparing to swarm, they're usually built near the bottom. So it's a lower location. A lower location on the combs. Okay? So you add all that together and hopefully you make the right decision. What are they up to? Okay? That's what you're trying to... So the emergency <coughs> cell and the supersedure, 
are, they would be located in a... They probably will be located on the comb surface. Okay. Thank you. But the supersede your cells we would expect would be larger. Okay. Larger, fewer number than emergency. Larger than the emergency because it, they contain um, uh, started from younger larvae. Okay. And you said the swarming cells would be near the bottom of near the, the bottom. frame of right. the frame? Right. But you also got to consider, are we in the swarming season or not? Yes. 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 Florida. Yes. Florida. Yes. Oh, but I'm just saying, when you find queen cells, yeah. that's the first question you've got to ask yourself. Um, How many queen cells would they make if they're going to swarm? Yeah. Uh, I say 10 to 15. Really? 10 to 15. Yeah. Whoa. Yeah. Lots of yeah. So to stop the swarm, then what do you, what's your opinion of a walkaway split? Do you, are you for it or against it? A split is, is an excellent way of, of stopping Even swarming. Even a walkaway split. Fine. Yeah. Yeah. There are other things you can do as well, but Before. that's as good a one as any. If you see queen cells, it's easy. <laughs> yeah. 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 Right, right. A typical walkaway split, you're not, you don't have queen cells yet. It's the All right. So, the, re the reason that for this slide is these are really excellent queen cells. Mm -hmm. Given their size and given the amount of sculpturing on the surface. Is that from a queen marine bar or is that? That's from a queen marine bar. Okay, yeah, I was going to say. That's from a queen marine bar. But I just, the reason I want to point it out, the more sculpturing that we see, we like to say that's an indication of how much care that queen received of her own. Yeah, it does. You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. Um, but these are nice long cells. Emergency cells have a runny appearance. Okay, small, gnarled appearance. So that may help you somewhat uh, as well. <laughs> All right, you go into the hive and you find a huge drone population. Rep forcing. Okay. What should you do? Well, first of all, <laughs> get a queen. What? Get a queen. Get a queen. <laughs> first of all, you need to realize there are two different conditions that can lead to large drone populations. All right. One is um, prosperity. The other is doom. <laughs> so upon finding, upon finding a large population of drones, you got to decide: is it prosperity or is it doom? All right. Somebody said it out loud here. When a colony is preparing to swarm, they raise a lot of drones before the, yep. before yep. the swarms actually start. The swarm. So it could be an indication that they're preparing to swarm, uh, which ultimately could be doomed. But having a large drone population can also mean that they've got a lousy queen or no queen at all. Okay. In fact, and again, you may not see this in southern Florida, but in the north, if you go into a colony in the winter, and find a large drone population, it, that's an indication you've got queen problems. <laughs> Normally, they throw the drones out on their ears in the fall, so let them, leave them to starve to death, but they will allow drones to remain if they're queen going into the winter. So you've got to decide, is it prosperity or is it doomed? But prosperity means the previous six weeks has been great. Good nutrition, lots of pollen, lots of brood. It's, it's a sign of, of prosperity. All right, the last thing is examining the cones will tell you how much honey. Eight pounds. Huh? Eight pounds. Eight pounds. Okay, yep. we'll see. We'll see here in just a minute. Now, again, Southern Florida probably is not concerned about it. But from Tennessee north, we talk about wintering. <coughs> What's that? <laughs> and we have to we have to have an indication of how much food should be left on a colony to get them through the winter. Of course, 
Under Tennessee conditions, we're talking 45, 50 pounds. Under conditions in Upper Wisconsin or Maine, we're talking 60 to 90 pounds. Okay, so it's important that in the fall, as part of your preparation for winter, you go into the county and you decide if they have enough food to get through the winter or not, or if you need to be, be feeding. And so it's important to get a rough estimate of how much honey is in the hive. A full depth comb is about six pounds, a medium depth three pounds, and a shallow about two and a half pounds. And so if you want to know how much honey is on a hive, even though you don't have winters, if you want to know just how much honey is on the hive and how much you're going to have to extract, you can get a ballpark figure of how much there is on your hive. A 10 frame deep is about 115 pounds. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. 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 I'm talking about actual amount of honey. I'm talking about actual amount of money. Okay. Um, I see I'm about out of time. That basically covers what I had hoped to cover tonight. Let me just kind of review with you for just a second. Excuse me. <laughs> review with you for just a second. When you go into a hive, it's important that you go into the brood nest on a regular basis because that's where problems originate tried to give you this evening a lot of clues of what to be looking for when things are not right. Okay? From the standpoint of diseases, white is healthy. Okay? Anything other than that? Uh, we, we explained a lot of them. Sunken cappings, holes in the cappings, spotty brood pattern. We can evaluate the quality of the queen. You can determine when a colony is, is preparing to swarm. These are all important things to tell you what you need to do from a management standpoint. I thank you for having me. I've enjoyed being here. You've had a lot of great questions.